laboratory directions for the digestive system, learning objectives for specifically the tubular portion of the digestive system. <coughs> Be able to distinguish the four strata in each region of the tubular portion of the digestive system. Recognize both the similarities and the differences of each region and relate the differences that do occur to the function of a specific region. Two, be able to distinguish the primary junctions that occur between regions that are found along the alimentary canal. Be able to relate the morphological changes that occur at these junctions to changes in function. This particular field illustrates a longitudinal cut through the esophagus. Note the following strata. The epithelium, a non-keratinized stratified squamous uh, form of epithelium, and then structure in depth very similar to that which lines the oral cavity. An underlying and supporting muc or lamina propria and finally a fairly robust smooth muscle band as indicated by the arrow which is the muscularis mucosae. So in the tubular portion of the digestive system these three elements the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosae constitute the mucous membrane or the mucosa of the esophagus. In this particular region, that is the tubular portion of the digestive system, the muscularis mucosae serves as a very distinct boundary illustrating and separating the difference between lamina propria on the luminal side immediately adjacent to the epithelium and the other type of connective tissue which lies towards the muscle mass, the muscle wall, which is going to be the submucosa. So this region here, with those three bands, the epithelium, the lamina propria, the muscularis mucosae constitute the mucosa. The submucosa is this intervening loose connective tissue arrow that will house larger vessels and perhaps even glands, depending on where the section is taken, is the submucosa. The third major layer is the muscularis externa, which will consist of inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal uh, layer as illustrated here. And there's a fine connective tissue seam that separates uh, those two uh, dense bands. And finally, the fourth layer that can be observed is a fine connective tissue layer uh, on the uh, exterior of this muscle uh, wall or this muscle tube, the adventitia, which serves to unite the esophagus itself to adjacent structures such as the trachea uh, and other tissues in that area. So these are the strata uh, of the esophagus. Now coursing lengthwise, one will see uh, lymphatic nodules within the lamina propria, they may even appear in the uh, submucosa. One can make out, if we course back here, uh, the fairly large vessels which reside within the uh, submucosa. This is also will be true of the remainder of the digestive tube. Here we can see coming into the field a fairly uh, well-developed uh, small artery and some veins associated with it that are being housed within the submucosa. They, of course, will send feeder vessels towards the lumen and support the overlying uh, mucous membrane, in particular the epithelium uh, in those regions further down. So this is a lengthwise cut through the human esophagus showing the various uh, strata that will be encountered. Now, in this connective tissue seam along the smooth muscle portion of the esophagus, one will find uh, the myenteric plexus or Auerbach's plexus. Uh, 
A similar plexus will be found occurring in the submucosa. Uh, the plexus associated with the submucosa is called a submucosal plexus or Meisner's uh, plexus. None of those are, are, are shown here at, at, in this specific, uh, at this specific magnification. It should be remembered that when examining the muscularis externa of the esophagus as shown here, which forms the most substantial portion of the esophageal wall, that the upper one quarter of the muscularis externa consists of skeletal muscle only. It receives fibers from the inferior constrictor muscle of the pharynx, and then uh, muscle becomes progressively more regularly arranged into circular and outer longitudinal layers from that point of origin. In the second one quarter of the human esophagus, a mixture of skeletal and smooth muscle will be found, while in the distal half, only smooth muscle will be present. And this is the particular section that is available in this particular uh, preparation. This is all from the uh, distal third or distal one half of the esophagus. The skeletal muscle fibers from the esophageal wall from the uh, upper one quarter are, have been shown to be type 2A fast contracting fatigue resistant uh, skeletal muscle fibers. When in the smooth muscle area, one should indeed be able to find, and we can see a, a bit of a nerve uh, plexus uh, coursing along here, elements of the myenteric or Auerbach's uh, plexus. So this is a longitudinal section uh, through the esophageal wall. This is the plastic embedded section of a cross-sectional profile of the esophagus as seen with the scanning objective once again. The lumen, as is in the, the entire length of the esophagus, is lined by a stratified squamous type of epithelium of the non-keratinized wet variety. It is very thick in its overall dimensions and as mentioned before, very similar in depth to the epithelium observed in the oral cavity. Also shown is a small lymphatic nodule within the lamina propria, which is shown here. And as we course through this cross-sectional profile of the esophagus, this large band of smooth muscle as indicated by the pointer and uh, coursing through the field is the muscularis mucosae. So this region here is indeed the mucosa, the epithelium, the lamina propria, the muscularis mucosae. Those three elements make up the mucous membrane in the esophagus. It separates the connective tissue of the lamina propria, that is the muscularis mucosae does, from the underlying submucosa which, as in the previous section we saw, also housed the larger vessels. And occasionally, depending on where the section was taking, taken from, one should also encounter esophageal glands. The remainder of the wall, or the substance of the wall, is made up of, in this cross section, as one can see, an inner circular layer of smooth muscle, which is extraordinary in its uh, dimensions. The connective tissue seam shown here, which will contain elements of the uh, myenteric or Auerbach's uh, plexus. And then finally we get to the more exterior part, the second component of the muscularis externa, the outer longitudinal layer, which also is considerable in its depth. And finally, though very light on this particular preparation, preparation, but nonetheless there, a very thin adventitia that is going to anchor this particular structure, that is the esophagus, to adjacent structures. So to repeat once again, layer number one beginning from the outside, the adventitia,
The muscularis externa, which we're crossing now, consisting of two broad layers, an outer longitudinal layer of muscle and an inner circular layer of smooth muscle, which in this particular region is all smooth, indicative that we are in the distal one-half or one-third of the esophagus. The next layer is the submucosa, and finally the mucosa itself or the mucous membrane which consists of a muscularis mucosae, the lamina propria, and the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium uh, of the wet variety. All features very typical of the human esophagus. This particular figure is the surface as seen with the scanning electron microscope of the esophagus. So we're looking at the luminal surface with the scanning electron microscope. What this shows is exfoliating squames, intact cells coming off from the surface. Here would be one of these flattened squame-like cells. Another one here. This one is becoming dislodged as is this one and finally exfoliating into the esophageal lumen. So this is the, a surface view of the stratified squamous non-keratinized variety of epithelium lining the esophagus. This specific region shows the distal esophagus with the esophageal epithelium uh, located at the tip of the pointer, lamina propria, and then of course the muscularis mucosae forming the mucous membrane of the esophagus. This is the vist very distal extent of the esophageal mucosa, and what this particular section shows is a very abrupt junction, as illustrated by the arrow, with the cardia of the stomach. So one sees here, at this particular location, a very, very abrupt junction where the stratified squamous, non-keratinized wet variety that lined the esophag esophagus throughout its length is now changing very abruptly to the simple columnar lining epithelium uh, so characteristic of the stomach. A very tall, mucus secreting, uh, simple columnar uh, type of epithelium. Also shown is the association of these infoldings of the mucosal surface or the epithelial surface into gastric pits that are characteristic of the stomach and associated with their bottoms or bases of the gastric pits are these mucous type of glands. The uh, glands of the cardia are sometimes referred to as the cardiac glands. So this would show the first gastric pit coming down to about this level and these tubules in this region here, anastomosing around it, are the uh, glands of the uh, cardia of the stomach. So if we can go down here where it's cut a little more vertically, we can see at least in this proximal most portion of the stomach, that is the cardia, one can see the gastric lining epithelium, which is a homogeneous type of epithelium made up of a mucin secreting simple columnar epithelium. It is thrown into millions of little down growth or sort of diverticula growing down, little tubular invaginations known as gastric pits or foveoli, and they're shown here and traced by the arrow. And at the bottoms of these gastric pits, the cardiac glands, or the glands of the cardia, empty into the bottoms of these pits or terminate at this level. So this is the ductal system of a, a cardiac glands, one of these simple branch tubular glands usually. Here's its secretory units, and they are going up and then emptying into the bottoms of the uh, gastric pit. Another gland is shown in this area and probably would making its way here. Another one you can see joining here. Uh, another here. Uh, 
and so this repeats itself uh, over and over again. So this is the uh, cardiac region of the stomach and what we're actually viewing of this region of the stomach is the mucous membrane or the mucosa. The muscularis mucosae continues uh, from the esophagus down to this level. You can see it has two or three layers uh, corresponding to the muscularis externa shown here, an inner uh, circular and outer longitudinal type uh, layers. In addition to the epithelium, uh, the glands are located within this connective tissue that's sort of hidden around and between the gastric pits and uh, sort of around the glands, so they're invaginated into the lamina propria which is also present here. It's uh, more cellular in uh, nature. It has uh, other cell types, mainly uh, immunocompetent type cells, uh, as well as a few smooth muscle cells and, of course, vasculature and what have you. But it's uh, obscured somewhat by the development of the gastric pits invaginating down into it, as well as the glands ramifying and twisting around uh, through it as well. So it becomes more hidden or compressed behind the epithelial component that catches one's eye. So this is the cardia of the stomach showing its abrupt junction with esophageal uh, epithelium or the stratified uh, squamous non-keratinized uh, type of epithelium. And this is the esophagus on this particular aspect uh, or side of that junction. The gastroesophageal junction seen at a slight increase in magnification. Normally, the uh, stratified squamous type of epithelium doesn't decrease in depth as it is in this particular section, but nonetheless, this is what this particular region uh, looks like. Uh, here it is fairly, uh, has a fairly decent depth. For some reason, it's thinned out just a little bit over a short point and then over just a single cell length it very abruptly changes to that simple columnar lining epithelium so typical of the gastric surface or the gastric lining epithelium. So this is the esophageal gastric junction, that abrupt transition seen at a slight increase in magnification. This is a low power field of a portion of the gastric mucosa taken either from the fundus or the body of the stomach, stomach that is characterized by the oxyntic or gastric type glands. The arrow indicates the position of the gastric lumen, so the lumen is being indicated by the arrow, and these small invaginations coming down to about this level are the regions of the gastric pits. As will be shown in just a moment, they are lined by a typical simple columnar type of epithelium uh, that produces mucin and is considered a typical gas, uh, mucin producing type of gastric lining epithelium. Now emptying into the bottoms of the gastric pits is indicated by the arrow here, here, and over here are these very long simple tubular or simple branched tubular oxyntic glands. So these particular glands are, have considerable length and they extend all the way down to the muscularis mucosae. So the muscularis mucosae, that surface lining epithelium with all the oxyntic glands is the mucous membrane or the mucosa of this particular region. Even at this low magnification, abundance of parietal cells can be visualized, these large round ones, as well as other cell types in the background. The lamina propria can be seen barely, uh, sort of obscured or forming around uh, the well-developed uh, oxyntic glands. So that is the mucosa 
of this region of the stomach. The submucosa is shown here. Like the remainder of the stomach, it is aglandular, but does contain the larger vessels that run circumferentially around the lumen and send feeder vessels to the mucosa. It also contains elements of the uh, uh, Meisner's plexus. We now enter the muscularis externa, a more robust circular layer as compared to the outer longitudinal layer. On occasion in the fundus in this region, uh, oblique fibers, innermost oblique fibers will also be observed. And then if we go to the exterior, though it's pulled off just slightly, one will see it is covered by the last or outer lying layer, a serosa a connective tissue containing fat vessels, but it's surfaced by this uh, simple mesothelial layer, uh, uh, the visceral layer of the peritoneum. So this is the fundic mucosa as, or uh, fundic stomach, I should say, as seen at low magnification. And as with the remainder of the gastrointestinal tract, the myenteric plexus, of course, will be found between the two layers of the muscularis externa, that is, the inner circular and outer longitudinal layers. This particular illustration is a scanning electron micrograph of the surface of the stomachs. So we're looking at from the luminal surface onto the mucosal surface. And this particular uh, figure illustrates the orifices or, or the openings of the gastric pits. So a gastric pit, the orifice thereof is shown here, one is shown here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here, with some exfoliating debris located here. One can also visualize with close observation the apices of individual cells. So these are the tops or the apices of that simple columnar gastric lining epithelium uh, that surfaces the entire stomach and actually forms the invaginations and lines the uh, circumference of the gastric pits, as you can see just going down in. So this is a surface view, uh, looking at the surface of the stomach with a scanning scope, demonstrating the orifices of the gastric pits or foveolae. The gastric lining epithelium as seen at increased magnification. That simple columnar lining epithelium, though it's cut at a bit of an angle here, as indicated by the pointer. And the mucin granules, uh, non-stained mucin granules, shown at their apices. So this, this is the gastric lining epithelium, a rather unique epithelium found nowhere else in the body. Uh, these structures, invaginations here, are the gastric pits. Another one is shown here. One is shown here. So these pits are indeed lined by the same gastric lining epithelium uh, as is on the surface. They simply are invaginations of the surface. So this is that surface lining epithelium or gastric lining epithelium. On occasion, underneath the epithelium and between glands, a few elements of the uh, lamina propria will be visualized and contain capillaries, blood vessels, and a variety of immunocompetent cells. This particular region shows the openings or the continuity of the tops of the oxidative glands opening into, or in between, or opening into, excuse me, the gastric pits, which is shown here. Another example of this phenomenon is shown here. The junction's right about at this level. This is the lumen where the arrow is of the oxidative gland, very narrow, and emptying into the base of that gastric pit. Another example is shown here. Now, as we course through and down towards the bottom of the oxidative glands, a variety of cell types can be seen making up 
the oxyntic glands. These large cells with an acidophilic or an eosinophilic background that sort of bulge away uh, from the lumen are the parietal cells. It is this cell type that produces the hydrochloric acid in the stomach as well as gastric intrinsic factor in the human population. Cells such as this, with these frothy looking granules in this particular specimen, are the mucous neck cells. And as we course down towards the base, or the bottoms of these glands, chief cells should be encountered. This particular field is of the bottoms of the oxyntic glands at extremely high magnification to demonstrate the chief cells which are confined to the base of these particular glands. This little tubule ends in a collection of chief cells. One is shown here, one here, one here, and one here. Another example is of one is shown here and outlined by the pointer. Another is shown here. They are characterized by the very large granules, these zymogen granules or preprepsinogen type of granules, as well as a basophilic uh, cytoplasm. As they are producing the enzyme pepsin in its precursor form pepsinogen, one would expect to find an abundance of rough endoplasmic reticulum for this enzyme, as well as well-developed Golgi uh, complexes. Now also shown in the field are parietal cells, one is shown here, some mucous neck cells, as well as numerous enteroendocrine cells, these light staining oval shaped cells in this particular area. Another one is shown at this location. So these are the enteroendocrine cells, those peptide producing uh, cells, producing peptide hormones that are going to influence gastrointestinal motility, secretion, and overall function. Another, more examples of the, what these enteroendocrine cells uh, appear as in this section are shown at the tip of the arrow. Usually oval or egg-shaped type cells, a distinct nucleus, a very light staining cytoplasm, and if we could go up at a higher magnification, one would, could, can visualize dust-sized uh, secretory granules. So these are, are endocrine cells and they're going to be uh, secreting to influence adjacent cells and into the surrounding uh, tissue fluid. Here's another example of an enteroendocrine cell. Another is shown here. And one can see in this particular region of the stomach they are in abundance. Uh, as indicated by the pointer. All of these oval, sort of round, egg-shaped type cells. A chief or a pepsinogen secreting cell is shown here. Another one is shown here where the zymogen granules are, are uh, quite uh, well delineated. Here's another example of uh, some of these cells, the, the chief or pepsinogen type cells. And as we course uh, up in the field of view, be replaced primarily by parietal cells that become the dominant cell type as well as a few scattered uh, mucous neck cells as indicated here. These cells sort of parallel, running parallel to the length of the oxyntic glands are smooth muscle cells. And here we can see some more uh, coursing towards the surface. They will actually extend up almost to the gastric surface lining epithelium and form a loose network around the oxyntic glands and will indeed contract and sort of have an accordion-like uh, action on these glands. Uh, so they form a very loose net, like a fish net, around the oxyntic glands and are thought to uh, influence their behavior and influence or give some degree of motility 
to the uh, gastric mucosa itself. Here we can see another smooth cell, smooth muscle cell as it's making its way towards the surface. These of course are all parietal cells characterized by that acidophilic cytoplasm due to the uh, tremendous number of mitochondria contained within, the, within these cells that take up the eosin dye. And these are examples here of the mucous neck cells. And finally, we should be approaching uh, the surface, and indeed we are, uh, showing that the glands empty into the bottoms of these uh, gastric pits. So those are the primary cell types of the oxyntic glands. The parietal cell, the mucous neck, the chief cell, and the enteroendocrine cell types. This particular figure is a transmission electron micrograph through a portion of a parietal cell as indicated by the pointer. This particular parietal cell is a non-stimulated parietal cell and this can be determined by looking at the canaliculi which are relatively are small. They have a few stubby microvilli projecting into their lumina as indicated here. Another, the canaliculus is coursing in this direction then meanders off in this particular direction. It's quite small showing only a few scattered microvilli projecting into the canalicular lumen. Note also the well-developed tubular fascicular component. These small vesicles of membranes that surround the canaliculi. So they are in abundance. Note also the scattered mitochondria which make up a uh, considerable volume of this particular cell type and why it acquires the reddish hue when stained with the hematoxylin eosin stain. It is these mitochondria that are staining. So this is a transmission electron micrograph demonstrating a resting or a non-active, non-stimulated parietal cell. This is an additional transmission electron micrograph of a stimulated parietal cell. Note the following differences as compared to the previous section. The canalicular size and lumen is much larger. It shows a much greater development of microvilli projecting into the canalicular system uh, in comparison to the non-stimulated uh, variety, as well as the loss of the tubular fascicular component uh, within the surrounding cytoplasm, though a little remnant uh, remains here. So this is pr approximately 10 to 15 minutes after stimulation with gastrin. This parietal cell responds and there is a flow of membrane, that is that tubular fascicular membrane, is added to the canalicular membrane uh, and as the cause of its tremendous increase in size and the development of an elaborate microvillous system within its canalicular lumen. In other words, there's a shift of membrane from the vesicular form to the canalicular membrane to provide increased surface area allowing the uh, transport membrane pumps to function, giving them more volume, more surface area, so a greater concentra concentration uh, can be achieved at this area. This particular region will, or illustrates a region of the distal pyloric portion of the stomach. And what will be demonstrated is, in a minute is the gastrointestinal junction. Before proceeding to that particular region, however, the lumen of the stomach is indicated by the arrow. What's shown here are several gastric pits invaginating from the surface. 
And of course, they are going to be lined by that very tall, simple columnar epithelium or gastric lining epithelium, if you wish to term it uh, that. Emptying into the bottoms of the gastric pits will be the overlying pyloric glands. Note the position of the muscularis mucosae. All the glands of the stomach lie on to the luminal surface of the muscularis mucosae. The submucosa is shown here, torn a little bit here, and the region towards the bottom of the field of view is the muscularis externa with its inner circular layer shown here, which is a little bit more dominant, and then the outer longitudinal uh, layer uh, as indicated here. And then the, the last layer will be a serosa uh, covering this uh, region of the stomach. So those are the regions and the basic architecture of the pyloric region of the stomach. Now if one courses distally towards the intestine and follows the mucosa, and we're keeping our arrow on the muscularis mucosae, one can see a lymphatic nodule coming into the field of view. And this scallop appearance is fairly typical of the rugi cut in section of uh, the stomach. It's sort of a uh, folded uh, nature to it. And all of a sudden, as we're tracing this muscularis mucosae in this direction, we see a dramatic change occur. From about this point on, though it's hard to, see, to demonstrate because of the glandular material here, the muscularis mucosae was coming here, it then is broken up and reconstitutes itself over here, and note the position of the glands now. They are submucosal, indicating that you're now within the duodenum, the most proximal portion of the small intestine. Also shown, in addition to that gland switch, glands going from a mucosal position to a submucosal position, one can very easily see, even with the scanning objective, at about this level there is a dramatic change in the type of epithelium. A change in type from this mucin secreting simple columnar epithelium or gastric lining epithelium, so typical of the entire stomach, to a change in color, even though we can't see the details as yet, to a typical intestinal type of epithelium. That is a darker staining type of epithelium and one that will be a heterogeneous type of epithelium being populated by typical enterocytes with the microvillous border, goblet cells, and a variety of enteroendocrine cell types. So we're going from a purely mucin secreting type, a very homogeneous type of epithelial lining because all the cells are virtually of the same type, to one that's heterogeneous, uh, one that has a variety of cell types uh, associated with it, but in this particular area, the dominant cell type will be the enterocyte, that intestinal absorptive cell with the microvillous border. Now as we course a little bit further, and they're a little bit obvious, or more obvious, though uh, a bit autolicized, one can make out the villi extending into the lumen, in this particular case, because of the type of material, they're vitalicized a little bit, so the lamina propria core is uh, pulled back a little bit and left the epithelium sort of hanging off its surface a little bit. Uh, these are the intestinal glands, or crypts of Lieberkuhn, uh, that are coursing down uh, into the lamina propria to the level of the muscularis mucosae. So this area here in the small intestine is all mucosa, consisting of villi, the intestinal glands, and the lamina propria forming the cores of villi and surrounding uh, the crypts of Lieberkuhn or the intestinal glands. The submucosa of this particular area uh, is dominated 
by the presence of the duodenal glands or Brunner's glands which are characteristic of the duodenum. So the submucosa shown here, this type of connective tissue is characterized by the duodenal glands or Brunner's glands. Immediately to the uh, exterior of the submucosa, one finds the muscularis externa once again, dominated by a very robust inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer as indicated by the pointer. In this particular case, because it is retroperitoneal, one will have it associated with an adventitia uh, rather than a serosa. So this is the gastrointestinal uh, junction uh, showing once again one of these very abrupt junctions with the stomach, uh, the epithelium going from uh, the gastric lining epithelium type to uh, a type that's typical of small intestinal, an intestinal type of epithelium, that heterogeneous form of epithelium. Now if one goes back towards the area into the stomach where we just uh, uh, were a bit earlier, here's the muscularis mucosae, and why this is pulled over and we have a little bit of vascular tissue I can't explain, but if we look now at that inner circular layer of the muscularis externa, one can see how it bulges out and forms a, a sort of a wad or a spiraling nature of tissue here. This is the pyloric sphincter. Usually it's uh, more closely aligned with the uh, epithelial type junction. That is where it ch the uh, gastric lining epithelium changes to intestinal epithelium. For some reason it is retracted up here just a little uh, bit, uh, but it's nonetheless very interesting uh, to see. So here's the mucosa. This is muscularis externa. The arrow is on the inner circular layer. It's the one that balloons up, forms this sphincter uh, type area and then will reconstitute itself as the uh, spiral of the uh, intercircular layer as we go down the intestinal uh, tract. So these are the features of the gastrointestinal junction as seen with the uh, low power scanning objective. This is the region of the pyloric stomach showing the gastric uh, lining uh, epithelium at a little bit higher magnification showing the gastric pits coming in uh, at these angles as indicated by the arrow and then this is the surface lining. Slightly autolicized uh, but nonetheless a fairly decent preparation of this junction. Now as one courses towards the intestine, the duodenum, one can see right about this level was this very abrupt transition once again to a typical intestinal lining uh, epithelium. Uh, these structures coming down, though they're a little bit uh, worse for wear, are the crypts of Lieberkuhn or intestinal glands. And if one looks carefully in, they're picking up a little brownish or uh, off-colored hue to them are the goblet cells. So this uh, little preparation of uh, this junction and uh, of human tissue does show a number of uh, good features. Here we can see the goblet cells once again, but these will be better uh, shown on uh, more well-preserved preparations. But nonetheless, one can visualize the intestinal epithelium, and uh, I think it's important to see this very abrupt transition, a very abrupt junction here at the uh, gastrointestinal junction. Remember the junction was the esophagus was also abrupt and occurred over just one or two cell lengths. This particular field represents a, a scanning uh, objective view of the pyloric portion of the stomach. You can see these large folds. These correspond to what, what is seen in the rugi in section. And also shown are the rather elongated gastric pits extending down into the lamina propria. So several of these gastric pits and then these mucus appearing glands as indicated by the pointer 
are the pyloric glands, which will then terminate or empty into the bases of the overlying uh, gastric pits. Also shown quite discreetly is the muscularis mucosae, as indicated by the arrow. So this region here is the mucous membrane of the pyloric region of the stomach, consisting of a simple columnar epithelium, typical gastric lining epithelium, a lamina propria that is invaginated in two by the gastric pits and is filled and obscured by the abundance of the pyloric glands as indicated here. Nonetheless, it's hidden and is found around the glands and between uh, the gastric pits where they invaginate. So th that is the uh, that portion of the uh, mucous membrane and then of course the muscularis mucosae. So the epithelium, the lamina propria, and this muscularis mucosae as elsewhere in the gastrointestinal tube constitute the mucous membrane uh, of this particular region. Also shown here quite well is the boundary and the limits of the underlying submucosa and then we get into the huge muscle wall of the stomach, the muscularis externa, which in this particular region consists primarily of a, a very thick circular layer and a rather thin, as compared to the circular uh, one, a rather relatively thin longitudinal uh, layer uh, of smooth muscle uh, forming this muscularis externa. So this is the muscle wall the muscularis externa consisting of an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer. And then it should be surfaced, though it's pulled off a, a little bit, by a serosa uh, uh, limiting its exterior uh, boundary. And that comes in and is shown a little bit better even at this very low magnification, uh, this connective tissue being limited by a simple squamous uh, mesothelium. So these are the three layer or uh, layers or strata of the pyloric region of the stomach. Now as with the remainder of the elementary uh, tract or canal of the gastrointestinal tube, even though no glands are present in the submucosa of the uh, stomach, uh, Meisner's plexus or that submucosal plexus Elements thereof will be found here, and the myenteric, which even can be seen at this low magnification, the myenteric plexus will lie in that connective tissue seam between the inner circular and outer longitudinal layers uh, in, in the muscularis externa. So if those elements are to be identified and examined, uh, this is where you will find them. So this is the pyloric portion of the stomach. And just coursing down, because this is fairly distal, and it's another section uh, through the gastrointestinal junction. Uh, we're now tracing with the arrow the muscularis mucosae, just to emphasize the point, following it coursing around we can see it's typical gastric lining epithelium with pyloric glands to the left of the arrow. So these are all gastric pit areas. You can see them extending down. The pyloric glands now being crossed by the arrow. The muscularis mucosae shown here. Now as we round this curve, so to speak, one can see that once again the very abrupt junction. These were our remnants of intestinal villi and glands shown here. And of course, the duodenal glands are, are protected, lying within the submucosa. So once again, you can perhaps see a little bit better than on the previous section, that switch in position of glands. Pyloric glands, like all glands in the stomach, on the luminal side of the muscularis mucosa, that is, they're all in the mucosa, whereas in the duodenum, these mucous glands lie in the submucosa, so they're beneath or on the muscularis externa side of the muscularis mucosa. And here are the Brunner, Brunner's glands here. This little lymphatic nodule can be quite well developed uh, in individuals. In earlier literature, 
it was uh, given the uh, term duodenal tonsil because it is found relatively frequently and I think it's estimated about 45 or 50 percent of the population will show a large lymphatic nodule at this very abrupt junction of the epithelia. And also shown here in perhaps a more appropriate position is the pyloric sphincter, uh, that intercircular coil that uh, develops uh, uh, in this particular region. So it has a more proper position, I think, than on the previous uh, section that was examined. This particular section is a plastic embedded section through the duodenum that's fairly well preserved. Once again, review at the scanning uh, level the four layers associated with the digestive tube. First of all, the mucosa can be seen. At the tip of the arrow is the muscularis mucosae the lining epithelium covering the villi can also be observed quite well as well as the lamina propria filling in the cores of the villi and surrounding these profiles of the intestinal glands or the crypts of Lieberkuhn uh, whatever term is chosen uh, to be used. So this area here from the tip of the pointer to the lumen at this area is the mucous membrane or the intestinal mucosa. The submucosa begins here and ends here and contains that uh, sort of diagnostic feature of the duodenum that is the duodenal glands or Brunner's glands. As far as the gastrointestinal tract is concerned these Brunner's glands are the only submucosal glands in this particular uh, tract, that is the gastrointestinal tract. Then if we go more towards the perimeter, once again the muscularis externa uh, is shown and we can see it shows its subdivision into an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer at uh, this particular magnification. And this is perhaps the more distal edge of, or end of the duodenum it appears to be uh, limited by its fourth and final layer, a serosa. Now also, uh, please do recall that the submucosa throughout the alimentary canal, beginning at the esophagus and going all the way to the anal canal, is going to contain elements of Meissner's plexus, these parasympathetic uh, neurons in that particular ganglia that lie in this area. And the same is true wherever smooth muscle is found uh, in the muscularis externa one will find in that seam between the inner circular and outer longitudinal layers of the muscularis externa the myenteric or hour box plexus which is shown here at the, with this scanning uh, uh, objective so it's going to be along that connective tissue seam scattered throughout the entire length of this particular uh, system. Having made these sort of macroscopic observations then go or proceed to the villi which are showing these finger-like extensions uh, sticking out into the lumen and examine these structures at increased magnification. A scanning electron Micrograph showing the sur uh, surface features of villi taken from the proximal duodenum of a human individual. Uh, so these are large spatulate type of villi. That is the apical surface of the villi uh, within the intestinal lumen. Uh, this was taken from a bypass uh, patient with surgery uh, due to uh, obesity. This particular field illustrates the top of a villus at higher magnification. So we're looking at the sort of the point of the villus as it extends into the intestinal lumen. Here lies the intestinal epithelium. Recall that this is a simple columnar epithelium despite this rather obtuse section. 
and one should be able to visualize quite well that microvillus border on the enterocytes. Also shown scattered, but not well, are few profiles of goblet cells, so this indeed is a heterogeneous type of epithelium. It will also contain other cell types, such as enteroendocrine and uh, uh, some other cell types that may be demonstrated uh, later. But at the apex of these villi, note this particular feature and the reason for going here. This is a capillary, a capillary complex that goes up and loops around and the enterocytes, the intestinal epithelium, lie right on this basement membrane being separated from it only by a basement membrane and endothelium. So one can visualize the absorption of material. The majority of absorption is actually going to take place on the, probably the uh, upper, the luminal two-thirds of these villi. So materials are being absorbed uh, through the epithelium and then are placed immediately into this vasculature. This is a uh, very important point uh, to visualize. Now as one courses to different villi, and we examine the very same features, it's just to illustrate that wasn't just an arbitrary villus that showed this feature, they all will show it if it's cut in section. So you can see this group of intestinal epithelial cells, this flow, is all of them are sitting and have direct access to the capillary network, this vast vascular network that uh, forms within the lamina propria and is within the core of these villi. This is cut a little bit obliquely, so we really can't see it. We're not getting into a true section of it. Uh, we passed that one, but here's another one where it's cut more or less through the center, so one can really begin to understand and visualize uh, this capillary network that the enterocytes or the intestinal epithelial cell are really lying on. Here we can see the intestinal epithelium, its microvillus border uh, uh, fairly well. And if one looks very carefully at this capillary network here, here you can see the endothelial cell nucleus and the cytoplasm extending in either direction. And it gives you sort of a microscopic or a, a small view of what's really going on uh, at the tops of these uh, intestinal villi. So that's a very important relationship to see, the intimate relationship between the overlying intestinal epithelium and the underlying vasculature, which is uh, very, very elaborate in its development. This particular figure is a scanning electron micrograph of a cast made through the, of the vas vasculature within intestinal villi. It is courtesy of J. Browning of Flinders University, South Australia. What it shows is the vessels coming up into the villi, which are at this location as indicated by the pointer. Another one is shown here. And what it demonstrates is that elaborate capillary network just underlying the intestinal epithelium covering the villi. This illustration is a transmission electron micrograph of the striated border or the microvillus border illustrating some of the microvilli extending from the surface of an intestinal epithelial cell. So this is the electron microscopic version or depiction of the my, uh, individual microvilli forming the striated border as was seen with the light microscope. Now returning to a slightly lower magnification, this particular field shows the apex of a villus or the top of a villus here, another one here, another one here, and finally another one here, the intestinal lumen being at this location. One can visualize even at this power the intestinal epithelium, the goblet cells identified by their 
clear accumulations of secretory granules that remain unstained. And this is the lamina propria core forming the center of the villi, which are now, which are then uh, covered by intestinal epithelium. Now, if one traces the villus core and the lamina propria more towards the outer wall, one will reach the base of the villi. The base of the villi are shown about this location, so this is where the villi begin and end. And these structures here are the crypts of Lieberkuhn, or the intestinal glands, uh, cut in various angles. Remember, these are simple tubular glands that were examined earlier uh, when considering the epithelia. Here we can see one cut more or less along its long axis, uh, starting here, coursing this way, and then finally emptying into the uh, base of between the base between two uh, villi shown here. And as we trace it up, you can see that though they're very close together. So this is an intestinal gland here as well. It has sort of a little bit of a coiled core, so it's emptying into this space between these two villi and then coursing down in this direction and probably angling uh, such as this. So these are all profiles, though they're not all cut lengthwise because of the tissue so folded. These are all profiles of the intestinal glands or the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Now note that the lamina propria fills the core of the villi and then surrounds those intestinal glands and completely uh, envelops them. All of this material here is that lamina propria. And closer examination will be uh, show that this particular lamina propria is part of the gut, the gut associated lymphatic tissue. And all of these cells, if examined at higher power, would be of the lymphoid series. Lymphocytes, differentiating plasma cells, you'd see eosinophils and leukocytes. So this is a complete sleeve this lamina propria of this gut associated lymphatic tissue that fills the core of the villi, surrounds the intestinal glands, and it begins higher up, but particularly prominent in the intestinal tract and in the colon, uh, will form a three dimensional sleeve all the way around the lumen from the beginning to the end of this particular tube. So uh, it's a a pretty elaborate and extensive uh, structure, this gut-associated lymphatic tissue. Now if we continue on, we can see the muscularis mucosae uh, as indicated by the arrow, and then of course Brunner's glands in the submucosal area. Now having confirmed these observations, then proceed and examine the epithelium at higher magnification of some of the intestinal glands and look for additional cell types, namely goblet cells, which can be seen here, and in particular, the enteroendocrine cells. Although the type, and there are probably 15 to 17 different types of enteroendocrine cell, at least the general form can be recognized on this particular uh, plastic section. So please identify some of these cells. This is a small region of the uh, duodenal uh, mucosa, but down in the region of the crypts of Lieberkuhn, or the intestinal glands, showing not only the lamina propria, and even at this intermediate objective, one can make out that these are majority of these cells in the lamina propria are plasma cells or immuno. Uh, competent type of cells. This is the intestinal epithelium of one crypt, another one shown here, here's a mitotic figure, another one shown here as we observed earlier. So this is normal intestinal epithelium. Uh, there's a goblet cell shown here, but what, what sh one should pick up on are these light staining cells, another light staining cell here with basically very light dust-like granules, another cell shown here, and another one in this particular area here. These are all species of the endoendocrine cell series. 
though we do not know what type unless we stain the granule specifically. So some of these, because they're in the duodenum, will be cells producing CCK, cells producing secretin, cells perhaps producing some VIP, and the list goes on through about 15 different peptides. So this is the cell type that's involved in this enteroendocrine secretion, both influencing gastrointestinal motility and secretion, as well as the behavior and secretion of the pancreas and the liver. These, this is that cell type that's responsible uh, for those physiological events. This is a section through the jejunum, so the intestine uh, a little bit further down the gastrointestinal tract. Like the remainder of the intestinal tract, it shows villi, though a little, perhaps a little bit smaller. Uh, these finger-like extensions extending out into the intestinal lumen where the arrow now illustrates. But this segment of the intestine perhaps shows a little bit better, and or in particular this section, are the intestinal glands or the crypts of Lieberkuhn, a little bit more uh, lengthwise in their cuts. So each one of these represents one of those intestinal glands. The muscularis mucosa is shown right at the tip of the arrow and perhaps is uh, a little bit thinner than more uh, proximally. Once again, the lamina propria continues to form the core of the villi and surrounds the intestinal glands as is shown here. So the rest of the features remain virtually uh, the same. Uh, also shown is a well-developed submucosa with the former muscularis mucosae, the lamina propria, and the intestinal epithelium and glands making up the mucous membrane or the mucosa. This is the submucosa. Then the muscularis externa, which shows up quite crisply here. That is, it's two subdivisions of an inner circular an outer longitudinal layer. And you can see, even at this magnification, it is limited by a serosa. That is that fine film of connective tissue surfaced by or covered by a mesothelium. The serosa is nothing more than the visceral layer of the peritoneum. Now, examine the intestinal epithelium lining the crypts and the walls of villi in this particular segment as well. In this particular series of slides, one should be able to see, and you get just a little bit of a red hue at the very base of the crypts. This is where another cell type, in addition to goblet cells, enterocytes, and endoendocrine cells, a cell type with very large red granules also resides, known as the panath cell examine it at increased magnification. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the mu in, uh, mucosal surface uh, demonstrating the villi lining the jejunal segment of a small in intestine. So the villi are showing here the tops of them sticking out and projecting towards the viewer. This little region here illustrates a strand of mucin or glycoprotein on one of the uh, villus tops. Again, this mucosal sample was from a human individual operated on for bypass surgery uh, in the hope of correcting obesity. This particular field represents the bases of the intestinal glands or the crypts of Lieberkuhn, another one shown here. What this particular field illustrates is panath cells, the pointer is now on the nucleus of a panath cell, the apex of which is filled with these orangish red granules. Another one shown here, another one here, another one here, another one here. This particular cell type, as illustrated by the tip of the pointer, and has a clear cytoplasm, this process that goes up to the surface, this is one of the types called an open enteroendocrine cell. So this is not a panacea cell, but one of the endocrine cells within this particular uh, region. Here we can see a developing goblet cell here, these oligomucus type cells. Uh, that's a name, another name given to them as they develop. 
Here we see another field of the uh, Pana cells, they're always found right at the very base of the crypts of Lieberkuhn or the intestinal glands, and then tucked in with them is a small enteroendocrine cell as well. Another example of some of these uh, Pana cells shown here, as well as quite clearly one can see an enteroendocrine cell at the tip of the pointer. If one looks very carefully at the base, you can see its secretory granules are accumulating basally because its secretion is going to go in this direction, probably to this capillary, which is uh, right here. You can see the little red cell uh, within it. And again, uh, every one, almost each one of the intestinal glands at their base, one should find these uh, Pana cells, scattered endoendrogen cells. And then if one goes up the villus wall or the uh, wall of the crypt, more goblet cells and more different types of enteroendocrine cell. Here one can see the muscularis mucosae in this jejunal section, seeing that it's made up of actually two layers mimicking the muscularis externa, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. And the muscularis mucosae throughout the gastrointestinal tract will mimic uh, the layering as seen in the muscularis externa. This interesting scanning electron micrograph is courtesy of Professor Sato of Ashikawa University in Japan. What it is is a digested specimen of the external surface of the crypts of Lieberkuhn or the intestinal glands. So we're looking at the external surface of these simple tubular glands. The lamina propria and other tissue has been digested away. So the intestinal floor, that region uh, in the direction of the villi, the villi will be uh, in the direction of the arrow, and the floor here, the villi growing out from that floor, and in between the villi, as you'll recall, grow down the intestinal glands, these simple tubular glands. This is a view after the other tissue, the lamina propria, has been digested away, simply dramatically illustrating that effect that these crypts of Lieberkuhn are simple tubular glands. And this is a view from their external surface. This very interesting scanning electron micrograph is from Professor Magny, J.E. Magny, of the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. It's a digested specimen of the mouse uh, intestinal mucosa, and what it shows is the intestinal villi from the uh, proximal genome that are quite spatulate, quite well developed. And what he's done is digested away the underlying lamina propria. So each one of these extensions down from the floor of the intestine shows the crypts of Lieberkuhn or the intestinal glands and their relationship to the villi. The orifice of one of these little crypts is shown at the tip of the arrow. So this is a quite spectacular and interesting scanning electron micrograph. This is a section through the ilium, uh, further down the intestinal tract. Intestinal lumen is shown at this particular location. Here's an intestinal villus shown here, another in intestinal villus shown here, and another one here. Note that the general architecture of the mucosa it is becoming thinner, though the elements still remain. That is, the villi and the intestinal glands or crypts of Lieberkuhn, although they are much shorter. Once again, the lamina propria forms the core of the villi and surrounds the uh, intestinal glands or these crypts of Lieberkuhn. Note also, as one goes downstream or distally, the increase in the number of goblet cells. Enteroendocrine cells, enterocytes, will still be uh, prevalent but the goblet cell catches one's eye as they dramatically show an increase in number.
the muscularis mucosae is shown, it's quite thin, showing right uh, at the tip of the arrow. So that will be the mucosa or the mucous membrane uh, consisting of the same elements as we described before. The submucosa is shown here. And then once again, the muscularis externa with its two layers, an inner circular, an outer longitudinal layer, and then finally a surrounding or covering serosa. A few elements of the myenteric plexus are still shown here and will continue throughout the extent of the gastrointestinal tract as was mentioned previously. An additional region of the ilium, note again the number of goblet cells, the rather short finger-like nature of the villi, and of course the intestinal glands that make up the mucosa of this particular segment. A well-developed Pyers patch is shown in the field of view. A well-developed segment of the GALT, or as a portion of this gut-associated lymphatic tissue, and one can see occupies a considerable region of both the lamina propria and the mucosa of this particular specimen. So this vast lymphatic accumulation to form lymphatic nodules, several nodules uh, amalgamating together form the Peyer's patches. And they extend throughout the lamina propria and even take over portions of the submucosa. Please be aware that these large lymphatic nodules are found scattered throughout the alimentary canal, beginning in the esophagus, found in the stomach, found in other regions of the small intestine and, uh, as well as the ileum, and extend all the way down through the various segments of the colon and down into the rectum. It, it is just that in the ileum they seem to have their zenith or uh, greatest development they can be seen externally through the muscularis externa and actually have been counted, uh, namely by Pyre after who they are named. Uh, and they're about the size of a small navy bean. So these large lymphatic nodules, even though some authors consider them characteristic of the ileum, and indeed most of the lymphatic nodular accumulation is located here, they can be found uh, scattered anywhere. They just have become associated where this study, intense study by uh, that individual, Pyre, uh, made a study in his initial uh, report many years ago. So these are these large lymphatic nodules or Pyre's uh, patches. Now that epithelium that overlies these lymphatic nodules and flattens out also contains another cell type in addition to the goblet cell and enterocytes as shown here that is not visualized uh, very well or can't be visualized on these sections is the so-called M cell. This is in one of the antigen presenting cells or surveillance type cells that will take molecules or uh, antigens from the luminal surface immediately overlying it, process them, and pass that information on to <coughs> subjacent lymphoid elements. So that cell type is associated with the Peyer's patches and is found uh, in the ileum as well, though we cannot see it on this particular uh, preparation. So these are the Peyer's patches. Uh, some people consider it characteristic of the ileum, but please be aware that the, the lymphoid accumulations are found elsewhere. And indeed, it is possible to get a section of the ileum that does not show these large lymphatic accumulations. Such a section is over in this segment, which is devoid of the pyrus patches, though it does show, of course, the galt. So this is the ileum as seen with the scanning objective.
A question that oftentimes arises is, how is one segment of the small intestine differentiated from the other? Simple logic usually will suffice. This segment of intestine, which is the first thing to be determined, is this a section of intestinal mucosa. The predominance of intestinal villi and crypts of Lieberkuhn, that is the intestinal glands, would suggest that this is indeed the case. Plus, if one o looked at the overlying villa structures and identified intestinal epithelium. So one knows there immediately in the intestinal tract with those observations. Secondly, the glands within the submucosa, Brunner's glands, tells you immediately this should be a section, a section through the duodenum because Brunner's glands or the duodenal glands are the only glands in the submucosa within the gastrointestinal tract. A very quick observation of the intestinal epithelium covering the villi will show a few scattered goblet cells as indicated by the pointer and can be seen with this scanning or low powered objective. So when one examines the intestinal epithelium, goblet cells are present and one can set a number uh, in one's memory that they're sort of scattered along and not an extraordinarily prominent feature. So if one moves the field, one can get a feel for the number of goblet cells present in this duodenal uh, mucosa or lining epithelium just by concentrating on the goblet cells alone. This is indeed the duodenal section. So this gives you a feel for the number of these mucus uh, producing cells, that is the goblet cells. This should be compared then immediately to the other segments of the small intestine, that is the jejunum and ileum. This now in comparison to the duodenum is a segment of the jejunum. Note that the villi perhaps are a little bit shorter and stockier, but this isn't obvious. The intestinal glands are perhaps a little bit shorter. But the most prominent thing to note is examine now the intestinal epithelium and compare it to that of the duodenum. Note the number of goblet cells. in this intestinal mucosa and covering the villi. I think one can reach the inescapable conclusion that they are roughly the same. Probably the same number of goblet cells in this mucosa, that is the jejunal mucosa, as was observed in the intestinal mucosa of the duodenum. But a feature that's missing within the submucosa are Brunner's glands. There are no duodenal glands in the jejunum as illustrated by the field as we are coursing along. So this piece of jejunum that was harvested for examination it's probably taken fairly well approximately. It has a mucous membrane or the number of goblet cells within this mucous membrane that shows you it's very much proximal, close to the duodenum perhaps. So we know it's a high segment or a proximal segment from the small intestine. But with the absence of Brunner's glands, which are found only in the duodenum, one must conclude that this is a section of jejunum, which is indeed the case. Compare this particular section of the intestinal mucosa with the two previous sections 
Note if one examines the epithelium over these short stubbier villi, the increase in the number of goblet cells. In addition, the villi appear shorter and more finger-like than compared to the others, and the intestinal glands perhaps are a little less well developed. However, the most prominent feature in comparison of between the three sections uh, being compared is the vast increase in number of goblet cells, suggesting that this section was taken more distally within the intestinal tract, which is indeed the case. So by using the features of the concentration of goblet cells present, as well as the presence or absence of the Brunner's glands or duodenal glands, differentiating segments for our practical purposes uh, should not be uh, that difficult. By looking at the concentration of goblet cells and the presence or absence of Brunner's glands and those segments in which uh, the number of goblet cells or the distribution of goblet cells remains roughly the same. So this is a section through the ileum as suggested by the vast number of goblet cells present within the intestinal epithelium and of course obviously there would be no Brunner's glands within the submucosa of this particular region.